I try to trick yeah, So, hello, everyone. <laughs> it is really my pleasure to welcome uh, a, a guest uh, today. And um, uh, Ms. Lillian Ankara is an art therapist. Uh, she's my guest, and she's someone whose work I have followed for several years. And uh, today, I am going to be asking her a lot of questions about the work that she does. Uh, she is the owner of uh, Creative Counseling Concepts, uh, which uh, provides uh, services mostly to children and their families. And so we have quite a lot of time today, uh, Ms. Ingram, to have a discussion about that work, because I'm interested in learning not just what you do, but how it benefits the people who come to you for services. Uh, so welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, the first question right out of the bat is why did you choose to become a therapist? So this is always a funny story I like to tell, but the, the truth of the matter is I wanted to be a pediatrician for a very long time as a child, as a teenager, and as a young adult going to college. And unfortunately, in my first year of college, I like to call the pre-med classes weed out classes. And so I feel like I just got weeded out in a sense. <laughs> and my, my goals just kind of changed. And um, I wasn't aware of art therapy, which is what I, what I do, and it's, that's, that's my career title, um, until a teacher of mine, I did an externship at my high school counselor's um, center. And uh, one of the teachers kind of knew I didn't, I had lost direction a bit. And so she had me just go to the computers that they have the high school students go to, put in your interest so they can spit out career options for you. So I did that <laughs> and I got back rabbi and art therapist. And I'm not Jewish, so I didn't think I could be a rabbi. <laughs> so I said, let me explore this art therapy thing and see what it's about. And at the time I started to get more into my own art, not career, but my own art interest. So I was painting, I was, I always loved photography, I didn't love that. And so I just kind of dived right in. And that's why I ended up being an art therapist. You know what's interesting about this? I never thought that, I know that you attended a very prestigious Pratt Institute. Yes. And so I never thought that anybody went to the Pratt Institute who was actually supposed to become a pediatrician, <laughs> you know, let alone a rabbi. Yeah. Who is not Jewish. <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly, it's kind of funny. <laughs> Right. So tell me about, yeah, so, okay, let's talk about your experience at Pratt, since that's sure. not exactly how you started or wanted to start. Right. So Pratt, I chose to go to Pratt because when I was looking at schools for art therapy, I, well, first of all, let me back up, I'd always wanted to go to New York. I grew up in Virginia. I went to, to college in Virginia, and I had this fascination with New York, and a fascination, almost like this side dream of maybe I'd be a photographer in New York one day, right? And so that was part of my photography passion. And so when I looked at schools for art therapy, I looked at a school in Philadelphia and I looked at Pratt, I looked at some other schools too, but because it was in New York, that was really my pool. And because they were very art-based and not as heavy on theory, which is also important, they teach a lot of theory, of course, but everything was experiential through art. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, because my passion for art was growing and growing and growing and really leading me, I knew that was gonna be the place I had to go to. It was expensive much more expensive than the other school I went to. So, you know, there's- I, I know, like, well, of course <laughs> it should be. It's quite prestigious. Right. I is. also know, I, I think your undergrad was at VCU. No, right? University oh, of Virginia. University of Virginia, okay. Mm -hmm. I thought it was Virginia okay. Commonwealth. Yeah. Right. And also so, school, but UVA is a great school. Yeah, <laughs> well. Like a plug. <laughs> yes. So how was it like starting, growing up in Virginia and then coming to live in New York? A bit of a, I mean, I grew up in Northern Virginia, so okay. it's kind of the outskirts of DC. So I always had this, this balance of, I could go into DC if I wanted to, and but I, I was in the suburbs of, of DC. So I kind of had, I knew like what a city felt like, but New York and DC are still very different cities. And so mm -hmm. it was a bit of a shock, but I loved it. I loved, I loved it from the moment we drove up and I stayed where I was staying. I kind of squatted at a spot in Harlem for about two weeks and then moved into a sublet in Brooklyn. And then I moved right before 9-11, I should also add. I moved two weeks before. So I didn't get to know New York pre-9-11, really. I was just kind of adjusting. So the New York that I knew was, I guess, 9-11 and on. 
to be honest. Mm. So everyone's told me that it was kind of, it was different. The feel is different for the city. Right, and I guess it also helped that um, you were already just, you are not just a kid going to college. Yeah. You already, uh, for you coming to New York was graduate school. Yes. And then working in, I don't know, in a hospital where you had so many people from so many different um, aspects of uh, healthcare and yes. social services. And so you were just, you were young, but right yes. in the middle of things. And right yeah. after 9 11, with all of mm -hmm. the best practices that everyone was trying to, to develop and accomplish mm -hmm. and so on, you were right in the middle of that. And yeah. so it really would make sense uh, that uh, you grew up so quickly in the practice of your profession. Yeah, yes, that, 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 is, true. <laughs> that is true. I mean, I moved, it was right after undergrad. I didn't take time off or work like some people did. I went straight. So I was one of the youngest people in my program at the time and um, had some maturing to do for sure. But it happened. You know, I kind of grew up. And just like you said, in this in in New York from 22 on, and and um, learned a lot along the way, made a lot of mistakes, but learned a lot and had a variety of experiences, and I wouldn't trade it for the world, you know. Right, which leads me to another question, uh, you know, uh, which is really, uh, what, where do you practice right now, and what areas are your focus in the practice of your field? Okay, so yeah, as an art therapist, I actually have moved my practice to be fully online. I did that pre before COVID hit. I, when I decided to move out of New York State and move back home to the Virginia area, I knew that I wanted to do an online practice. As fully licensed in New York, I see clients primarily based out of New York. And so I know earlier you stated about seeing children. I actually don't see as many children now as I used to, but my mm -hmm. full career from when I started the internship on, I saw a lot of children constantly and work with children and families in a variety of spaces. So currently I see mostly adults, some teenagers, some, some younger kids, um, we're mostly working with traumatic experiences and traumatic backgrounds. Um, I worked in domestic violence for 12 years. And so I have a lot of experience with, with, with family trauma, with um, childhood trauma, people who are adult survivors of, of childhood trauma or childhood abuse you know, from their families or unhealthy relationships and building healthy relationships. So I do a lot of that type of work in my practice. Well, I'm right. glad, yeah, I'm glad you brought it up because it's mm -hmm. one of the things that I like to explore further mm -hmm. uh, because trauma is something that we all really get into learn a lot more about. Mm -hmm. And you're definitely ahead of the curve um, as far as that is concerned. And uh, I am just wondering if that idea, I was partly behind the whole concept uh, that led you to create uh, the creative counseling concepts. Mm -hmm. um, and what were you thinking when you did that? So yes, I, I knew, so, so yes. So I guess to answer your question, I knew that I wanted to go into private practice after my last employee situation. And I worked there for eight years and it was a very valuable experience. But I also got to see a bit more of the space of what owning my own business would look like or being in private practice for myself would look like and the freedom that I wanted in that. But I, I feel like I have taken all that I have learned from my actual schooling to the experience I had and all the jobs I've had to, to really build upon how I show up for clients and how I can hold space for them, especially when they when they have traumatic histories and, and, and share with them, but also help them on their healing journey. And so I hope that answers your question where I feel like I've kind of- Absolutely, on. yes, you absolutely did. And uh, it actually also validates uh, some of what I've been thinking lately. Uh, it, only this week, actually, in two meetings, I did say that um, I thought it was important for me to begin to look at, uh, for example, the way that I assign, you know, you know place some intentionality into some of, uh, what I do as far as educating uh, graduate students who will become the future psychotherapists uh, to make sure, for example, that the classes we offer them are not such that they learn about trauma and stress and coping among adults uh, without first understanding uh, that there is indeed adolescent and childhood trauma. Yeah. So it seems to me that what you're saying really supports that idea. 
-hmm. that there needs to be an understanding not just of that um, of that reality, but that the exposure can actually happen to trauma yeah. much younger. Definitely, definitely, and I also think to go with that point, the the space of capacity building or resiliency building can also happen at a younger age and not that you know we have to be so resilient to go through horrible things but the space of like if life is going to throw us a lot of stuff how can we start to build that type of resiliency in children and or capacity in in their caretakers as well you know but also younger you know starting younger so I, that's why i've always loved working with children because because you know no matter what they're coming for that's part of the work you know we're treating what they've been dealing with and helping them in healing, but also helping them find the resources, helping their caregivers be resources and helping them to, to, to build resiliency and to build like their, their creative skills so that they can create these spaces of safety as well. I hope that makes sense. Right, I do like this conversation because we've only been talking for a few minutes and I'm already thinking about when I can bring you back <laughs> on a bigger stage and I, I'm, t I'm gonna tell you why. Uh, just even the discussion of resiliency, I think is that alone can fill a lot of space because then the question is, uh, especially when you work with children as you're talking about and talking about resilience even at that stage, uh, there is an important question to be answered, to explore, because it will help all of us. But uh, for example, how is it that to I'm not asking you to answer the question, I'm just thinking aloud. Uh, two children can grow up in the same home, have what we consider to be similar experiences, yeah. and then come out so differently where one, for example, ends up in prison for life, mm -hmm. and the other one ends up as a college professor or as a successful mm -hmm. person. But uh, some might argue that the difference is resilience, and some might say, it's also about the people that those children met along the way mm -hmm. or the paths that they took. Mm -hmm. uh, but when someone like you has been in a space where you have worked with these issues, you are then better able to help us understand and prepare you know, for some of these things. So that whether people are pastors or psychotherapists or teachers or just regular parents, they can have some of these elements yeah. to work with in the, in the things that they do. So you say we can, you're coming back, right? Yeah, yeah I will come back. So, <laughs> thank, so I'll come back. Right. so thank, thank you. But, uh, but sincerely, uh, who is therapy for? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I believe therapy is for everyone and anyone who, who wants to who's ready for it in the, in the sense of, do I want to look at some of the things in my past that I know show up daily or show up in my life that cause blockages or cause me to feel stuck or cause issues also, but even if that's not the case, do I want to just explore these other parts of myself? Do I want to, um, do I want to kind of find different ways of being present with myself and others? Do I want to because I think some people think that therapy is just for if you have major issues, quote unquote, you know, mm -hmm. if, if there's something that's really wrong. And I like, I want to create the space of normalizing this space of having some place to go to, 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 to put down the stuff that you've been carrying, you know, so it doesn't have to be major issues. It could be just, I want to create, I want to make sure that I am being healthy in my relationship. I want to make sure that me and my partner, even though we don't have a major fighting, but we want to just make sure that we can communicate in a, in a way that, that, that is healthy and that can be supportive to build a family and bring children into it, you know? And I, I, I've met individuals who talk about that with their partner and how they, they are hoping that they can go to a couples counselor for that. And I think therapies for that too, you know? So it's about just maintaining health, finding health, seeking out health, healing and maintaining it. Right, so what brings people to you typically? What brings people to me typically is, um, like I said before, the relationship trauma, I get a lot of clients who've experienced either past relationships, romantic relationships that were abusive, like intimate partner relationships that were abusive or hurt, harmful in the past or currently. Um, people who've had childhood traumas that they want to start to look at and, and unpack and really find some healing around. Um, people who want to explore their, their sense of their creativity and how they want to feel empowered around that. Um, 
people, some, some parents come to me with their children who have some behavioral issues or have some difficulty expressing themselves um, or have teenagers who are asking for therapy. And even though the parent might not be that open to it, they want to make sure their child gets help, which I always think is really powerful. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, you did. And I'm glad that you mentioned that because it brings me to uh, something that I think that we probably have a responsibility to discuss as people of color. Yeah. Um, that is that I, I would like you to speak to the perception of therapy, not just the process, but, uh, but um, the work itself and the existence yeah. among people of color. Mm -hmm. Do mm -hmm. you think it is as well embraced as it ought to be? And where are we? I think it's getting better. And I have to stay hopeful about it. I think it's getting better perhaps because a lot more celebrities are speaking out about their process of therapy. A lot of social media speaks to going to therapy. There's a lot of campaigns or social media, I guess I'm just using the word campaign loosely, but like social media campaigns around, you know, promoting mental health and mental wellness. And it's okay to not feel okay at times. And there's places to go to talk about it. So I think there's still a stigma around it. Um, I think that, especially in community, communities of color, when we think historically of how the, the systemic racism that exists in a lot of these power structures, is about whether it's the medical field, whether it's a variety of other fields, but the mental health field too, and as extension of the medical field, you know, when there's a system that has been that, that, is, that has a lot of racism in it, and a lot of the players might hold their own internal bias and internal racism, it acts out against people of color and their bodies of color. And so that's not a safe place. And so people will automatically, you know, want to want to rebuke or run from something like that, that, that can come in to somehow steal their autonomy in a way, you know, or steal their sense of self or rob them of it because historically it seemed to have done that. So I think that stigma might still be present, but I think it's getting better. Right, and what do you think our responsibility is as uh, people of color who know this process and know the advantages mm -hmm. of therapy uh, to be able to drive the awareness? The, the reality is that even for those of us who are, um, well, what anyone might call professionals, we were traumatized uh, by the events of the last four years in this country. Yeah. And of, although there's a very long history of that, um, and as we go forward, understanding that people are still reeling mm -hmm. from the negative exposure to many of the things that happened, whether it was George Floyd or the Capitol Hill um, siege and the daily experience of racism to which you have already alluded, these experiences are really not completely divulged from who we are as right. individuals and as people. Mm -hmm. So what is our own responsibility as people who know, even when we don't have access to the campaigns that celebrities have, yeah. how do you think that we can really share this and make people buy into the fact that therapy is not just for the rich white folks who right. are the perhaps the greatest beneficiaries of the process, right. but that people of color should also be doing it. I think that it is important for people to know we exist as psychotherapists of color, you know, so that yeah. they know that the resources are there because, you know, there's that old saying, if you see it, you can be it. But but more than that, if you see people that look like you doing the service, you might trust it more. You might be more welcome to it, more open to it. So the fact that we are visible is big, you know, um, using whatever platform we have to, to make a little bit of noise, to, or a lot of noise, to, to be seen and to be heard and to speak up. You know, I think that one thing, it's really important to be trauma informed and understand trauma in order to obviously more than that, to treat it, to be trauma trained, but trauma informed in, in how you hold space, but also to be socially justice minded too. So that, because then when you work with people, it's not just in this little bubble, it's, it's looking at them as a part of this fuller community and how this community impacts them and how our country impacts them and society and the world and, and taking that 
into account when you're working with them, but, but spreading that information as well so that people know that what they're feeling is real and people feel it too. So they feel a bit more normalized and know that they can go to someone like near you to work through these issues. Yes, I do like when you can say, as I just said, that there is a place for social justice in clinical practice. Yeah. Um, because really, it should be about that in most, it should be about liberation and uh, freedom. So if you could just share with us one or two experiences of what you will call success in your work. Okay, it's it's interesting because that's an interesting question because I I don't know I like I believe in success stories of course but I I think that when a client makes whatever gains towards whatever goals they might have even small ones I think those are success stories and so I feel like I have a multitude of success stories for example even when I worked with a client for a while um, who had been through an abusive relationship and was trying to co-parent with her abuser, which a lot of people have to do, um, and trying to maintain, maintain her own safety and her child's safety. And there was one day when we were talking about the power dynamic and how she felt fully and believed because of all that has happened that his power dynamic, like his power level was here and hers was here. And we just kept talking about how in actuality it should be here. And, but I did that thing that was something in my hands weeks before. And then one day we came, she came in and we were talking and I did it again and, and it clicked for some reason that she was like, I can be as empowered as he behaves. I can draw boundaries. I can do these other things, which she just never thought she could before because of all the the, the, the cycle of the, the abuse from him. So, so when she got that piece, it was just like this light bulb, you know, and not that it was just, I mean, it was also about his behavior too, like, which is what he was doing. But when she saw that she had more options, in order to exercise her sense of power as well to, to try to even out this playing field. Um, that was that was amazing for her. So I um, hope that answers your question a little bit, but it's, it's, it's small things. You know, I don't think it's the one overall, you know, success story. I feel like it's it's small things for all of my clients. Right, it does indeed answer my question as every one of your answers. Um, I always has. feel like I'm missing the mark somehow, so I'd no, like to ask no. to make sure I'm being clear. No, I actually, I will ask you one final question. And I think it is because I feel that sometimes uh, we, I know personally, because you know, I'm constantly busy, we get lost in what we do. Mm -hmm. And it's not that easy also to have to constantly try to work with people yeah. on issues at any level, whether you're a psychotherapist or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it leads me to ask, not about myself, because I'm probably already a lost cause when it, you know, when it gets there, <laughs> about self-care. What do you do for self-care? So for me, for self-care, I think self-care is not because I think self-care gets this wonderful, like commercialized look of like bubble baths and you know, picture nail, things like that, right? And that's not, to me, I think that's true self-care. Is it nice and nice to be good to yourself? Of course it is. But I think for me, the way I exercise my self-care is I try to be very patient with myself and I create space where I need to create space. Even that means I have to reschedule a meeting that <laughs> that might be what I do for my own self-care. <laughs> but also I think as a therapist, Part of our self-care plan has to be our own therapy. And since I moved to Virginia, I've been looking for the right fit for a therapist. I know that's a priority for me. I think good supervision is part of self-care when you're seeing clients. Um, I think I like to I like to meditate and also journal. I think that's really important. I'm working on my yoga practice because I also believe in this mind-body-spirit connection as well. Um, and sometimes even this might feel weird, this might you might actually like this because you are constant studying students and going for more education, but sometimes even certain trainings can feel like self-care because it helps us feel like, okay, I can, this part feels very competent and I can be present for my clients in this way. And that might help with even the, the dynamic in the therapy. So, but I hope that, yeah, that, that's, yes. and for me also being with my family, that's part of my self-care too. So Wonderful. I a week of hard sessions and go and laugh with my nieces and nephews and be super silly. That's what I need. Yeah, I really like to thank you for the time that you have spent um, nice. uh, with us today. And we already secured a deal on camera that you're going to be back. 
<laughs> and uh, so I'm really looking forward to that because I really like to explore with you more and more. Uh, explore the trauma piece of face yes. because at all so many different levels we have all um, been experiencing trauma and so I, I like to really not just as individuals but also as a nation as a world <laughs> you know so and nobody has been completely removed right. uh, from the impact so right. I, yes and one thing I did not actually dive into which I probably could have and maybe I will the next time is the art therapy specific piece about how that can help with traumatic experiences. There's Please so go much. ahead. We have time. <laughs> I'll just quickly say there's so much power in the nonverbal, you know, and as an art therapist, we believe the creative process is intrinsically, can be intrinsically healing for somewhere. You can work through so much without having to say words, you know, and, and just working through the images. And a lot of times if we have trauma, especially from childhood or early childhood, a lot of that's embedded in a space that was pre-verbal. And so sometimes that can, the, the nonverbal and the image can be part of that release and that can be very powerful. So that was my little spiel. Oh, thank you very much. And you know that there has been a great lot of uh, research done over the yes. uh, for years now about the adverse childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. And so I would like to have um, some extensive discussions about that the next time that you come because you can actually see the impact from childhood all the way through yeah. the, the life course. And um, the, I can just imagine uh, the role of art therapists, mm -hmm. uh, not just in trying to stem that, but in actually really attaining the successes at the various points mm -hmm. to help people actually achieve that, that is needed to be achieved. Uh, but I really like to thank you very much. And I wonder if you have uh, any final comments for us. Um, that was it. This has been fun, even though I'm always <laughs> I try to avoid interviews, but this has been very fun. So thank you. Yeah, I know. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much. And I know that you don't like interviews very much. You know, but I'm doing I'm better. That... I'm getting better. Yes. We're all growing. We're all growing, right? <laughs> it's part of my evolution. <laughs> So thank you very much for coming. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.